look at it, uh, electricity and stuff, we look at positive and negatives, and we're all made out of electricity, so that's easy to understand. Um, for everything on the positive side, there's a negative. Um, and that seems to go a little bit further than if I would say I would lay a Bible down in front of somebody and try to beat religion into their head. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You have to you have to get to an understanding of something they understand and can relate to. And in most of these cases, Rob, you'll find that these people are going through either some kind of dysfunction. Right. Um, in my case, it was the neg- the negative feelings. If you remember, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I had a, a bunch of different things going on. Yeah. And you have to retrain them on how to think, how to live a positive life, how to live a healthy life. Um, that is just as important as doing any sort of blessing or anything, because if you miss that step, they'll just get themselves in trouble again. Does does the power of the church really have the ability to cast out these these demons, these entities, without the conviction and the hard work of the people who themselves are being victimized and terrorized by this demon? Well, what we're finding, we're finding there's some cases where, you know, that, that, that process of exorcism has to be done numerous times. Mm-hmm. But what we're also finding now is an alarming rate of people that do not take the next step and do not, you know, change the things that uh, help them participate in their own haunting. And so it comes back. It's almost the best way I can describe that to you is think of the abused woman. You know, she goes to gas for help, right? Yep. Or anybody that's under abuse for that matter goes to ask for help. And instantly they start sticking up for the thing that's causing the abuse. Right. We're finding this with these demonic cases now. Really? Yeah. And what's worry, what's worrisome about that is if you have somebody that comes to you for help that really isn't seeking help, you're mm-hmm. never really going to help them. So we're coming to a state when I believe, and I seriously believe this, that we're going to have cases out there that are just absolutely impossible to ever help these people. They're to the point of no return. How do these, how do these entities, these, these demons, follow people? Well, how do they get attached to them in the first place? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, um, in my case, it was, you know, uh, I kind of put the invitation out there mm-hmm. um, to, to um, fight with me because I thought that's what you needed to do, which was really wrong. Um, understanding that now, I wouldn't have done that. But uh, also there was, and I can talk personally, and I think talking personally about it is a lot easier to understand for people. Um, you know, I, I, I continually, I beat myself up for the haunting. Uh, I, I, you know, it was the almost the poor me scenario. You know, you put the kick me sign on your back and say, kick me. Well, mm-hmm. you leave that, that, that haunting sign on your back and guess what? The haunting sticks around. Um, and that's not good. And you have to start living your life in a different way. So would you say that in some cases there's a symbiotic relationship that is formed between the, the victim and the, the entity? Oh, absolutely so. Absolutely so. And I think what does it is the idea of um, they get used to the uh, adrenaline rush, the mm-hmm. constant chaos. And then when you take that away, what do they have left? An empty you shell. You know, in, in, an empty shell. Yeah. yeah. And you have to learn how to refill that shell. And that's where the problem lies. How, how, long, how, do, you, how do you get back to, to normal after you've gone through hell and you've come back again? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, it takes a while to do. You know, I was lucky, Rob, because he, what you don't, don't understand is I, I had an open heart surgery. Oh. Um, and during that, during that, of course, I died and I went through some things. Right. And uh, it wasn't the white light scenario or anything like that. But uh, he, I came to the understanding through, through all of that that I, the moment I came out of that state, which, you know, I... I was falling, and then my body hit itself, and it, you know. And then I had the thought when I was coming to, I know why babies cry when they're born; it hurts. And it was strange, mm-hmm. but um, the moment that moment, what it, what it did for me is the the haunting stopped. Everything stopped, and I went back to the way I was beforehand. So right. it took me about six months and a little bit of depression. I got to mm-hmm. tell you, I needed to struggle with it to realize that. Um, that the haunting was gone in that it was me that caused a lot of it by bringing it into me 
and then I had to die to get it to go away. That's uh, tough. That that is. It's also very. It must be. Very, is it hard for you to to go back to those days and to relive the the events that you went through over and over and over again, telling your story, or do you feel that you're, or is it a way to help other people? And this is what the cost of the help is. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's times when it's tough. It's not Mm -hmm. as tough as it was in the beginning. In the beginning, it was a reliving every single time. Um, I think through the years, I've been able to insert some humor um, into it, which helps me get through it. But there's still those moments, especially when I talk about my daughter um, and carrying her out of the house in my arms, that it really affects me, yes. In a, in your best estimation, how many people in America today, today do you think are undergoing serious hauntings? Well, it's hard to say because, you know, if you, if you talk to some people in the mental health industry, mm-hmm. they'll tell you that their mental their institution's full of them. Um, you know, as far as the cases, it seems like the cases are on the rise. Um, what they were, what used to be maybe 1% of the cases has probably gone to about 3 to 4% of the cases now. Wow. Some of that, I think, is um, the media that played into it. But um, I think that we are probably facing end times, and I think everybody feels that at this point. And I think that the closer we get to that, the more severe um, these things are going to get and harder to handle. All right, my friend, please stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Stephen A. Lechance is our guest. We're talking to Stephen tonight about his book, Blessed Are the Are the Wicked. And we're also talking about ghost hauntings, demons, and things that go bump in the night. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Stephen A. Lechance's website is www.stephenalechance.com. We'll be back on the other side of the news. Don't go away. Hi, this is Rob McConnell, just letting you know that the X Chronicles newspaper is now available online at www.xzonebookclub.com. All past editions and current editions of the X Chronicles newspaper are available for 99 cents. That's www.xzonebookclub.com, and that's 99 cents U.S. per edition. And don't forget, the X Zone store is now open as well for all of your X Zone Nation merchandise www.thexzonestore.com Do you have a disease that you would like to alleviate through a natural means? Have you been contacted by angels, ghosts, or even extraterrestrials and want to validate these experiences? Or would you simply like to speak with someone who can help you find your life's purpose? I'm Dr. Joseph Mara, and I'm offering my services free of charge for first-time clients contacting me during the month of April. These free consultations include angel card readings, guided meditations, life coaching, and energy healing. If you have always wanted to explore these types of experiences but were skeptical or simply could not afford them, then take advantage of this free special offer. Contact me through my website, a guiding light spelled L-I-T-E dot com, to schedule your consultation today. Until then, I offer you love, light, and laughter. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. My guest this hour is Stephen A. Chance. We're talking to Stephen about his new book that's entitled Blessed Are the Wicked. And um, first of all, Stephen, great having you back on. It's always nice talking to you. Congratulations on your books. And, and you've been doing a lot of media work these days. Yeah, I oh, have. <laughs> 
My goodness. In good, good positive media work. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, that that is so important because there's so much crap out there. Mm-hmm. And, is, and you really, know, really whether it's in ufology, whether it's in uh, the search for Sasquatch, monsters, ancient times, ghosts, there's a lot of crap. So how would you best best tell a listener tonight how they should or what they should use as a bench test when it comes to some of these shows that are out there as to what's real and what's not? Well, first, the first thing you need to understand is that you, when you see a show that's a weekly show, mm-hmm. um, those people are having to produce something every week. And ghost hunting in uh, the, the, the process of helping people and in anything that you do with the paranormal is not something that produces cons- consistently on a consistent basis. Uh, so when you're seeing a show that every week, you know, they have doors slamming and they have all of this going on and it's way over the top. If that show is way over the top every week, uh, chances are they're probably playing some games on you. Um, because what the work that we do is a lot of quiet work. There's a lot of quiet time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't take, you know, one night in a location. Sometimes we're there three to four nights, you know. Um, so what, what I find that interesting is I watch the shows and I see all stuff break loose. And then I go, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that could not have possibly have happened that yeah. way. And another thing is when they don't offer you explanation other than the paranormal. Uh, you know, I have to be, when the, the work I do, I have to be the biggest skeptic in that room at any given time, or I am going to miss something that is important. And when you see a show where everything they touch is paranormal and they never question it, then you better start be questioning what you're being shown. Besides the your own case, what other cases have you worked on that have just you know, raise the hair on the back of your neck. Well, I think the one case that sticks out in that way was the exorcism that I did um, back in, what was that, 2006. Uh, I actually participated in an exorcism. There was a little girl that, when we got involved with the case, was being told to, um, uh, her doll was telling her to smother her little four-month-old brother. Oh, my God. Um, She was only four-year-old. Um, it turned out to be the mother, though, that the thing was actually attacking. The mother didn't want anything to do with her children, anything to do with the newborn. Um, we did a tape with her, which, you know, when I, when I interview somebody, I'll, I'll tape it. Mm-hmm. And then when I went back to la- listen to it, there was a part where you hear her voice start to kind of um, split off, and you could hear different voices. And then at one part of the tape, she said, I walked into the kitchen and I found the refrigerator open. And in this low voice, you heard this voice say, well, I opened the refrigerator. And hmm. at that moment, it was quite clear that we were dealing with something else. Interesting case, though, Rob. I had to go to an evangelical exorcist. I couldn't go to your typical priest um, because this woman had been raped by a priest at a very young age. Oh, my heavens. So uh, I had, yeah. I mean, you know, so, you know, you can understand the dysfunction and everything that involved from that. I actually led her into this possession. But at the one point of the exorcism, she got up to run away, and I and I went after her to help her. Mm-hmm. And I, I get, when I got to her, she was um, she was she was sick to her stomach, and uh, this black stuff was pouring out of her mouth that kind of looked like crude oil. And I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. And I was holding her body, and I felt her bones readjusting, her her vertebrae pop, her ribs moving around. And at one point she passed out and I brought her back in and I laid her down and the exorcist looked at me and he goes, you felt it, didn't you? And I was white. I must have been, I must have looked like a ghost myself at that point. And I looked at him and I said, I had no idea it was so physical. Um, but that case stands out in my mind as frightening because I didn't realize how physical possession could actually be and how physical things could attack our physicality in such a way that actually transform who we are on the inside. Um, and that bothered me, I think, more than the mental stuff, actually. So how different from the Hollywood version of The Exorcist are real exorcisms? Oh, my gosh, they're night and day. They're night and day. But, I, you know, everybody talks about the bad part of the exorcism, mm-hmm. and there is some bad parts, but it's not the green eyes or the spitting of pea soup or anything like that. <laughs> you know, there's, there's the, but there's a point in the exorcism that I always like to talk about, and it is when, 
And I, the only the way I can describe this people is I, I try not to use religious terms, but I'm going to here. 